Welcome, everyone, to another broadcast of The Soul of the Everyman on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are podcasts. You can find them at artistfirst.com. We welcome your questions by email at dj at artistfirst.com. Now, out to your hosts, Michael and Margaret Lines. Thank you very much, D-Man. And I'm Michael Lyons. And I'm Margaret. And if you've come here for normal, you've come to the wrong place. <laughs> mm. This is true. But if you come here at all, I think you probably know that we're not normal. <laughs> My. Anyway, so... um. We may be having some audio visual tonight. We'll we'll see how it goes. But uh, we're going tonight's topic. We're talking about um, you came up with Margaret. It was uh, the normalcy bias and uh, um, normalcy bias. N- n- right, I'm saying it wrong. I think. Yes. Normalcy bias. Uh, and 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 kind of not pivoting off of that, but kind of turning it more into you know sort of what we typically talk about is, you know, the whole concept of, of normalcy. So we have this really boss quote that we, um, that we dug up from, um, a really not normal guy. (laughs) So maybe you want to, let's lead with the quote this time. All right. This quote is from Vincent Van Gogh. Normality is a paved road. It's comfortable to walk. But no flowers grow on it. Exactly, no flowers grow on it. It's, and I think what he was really talking about was that the normal is sort of the anti-flower. Um, and and why why is normal anti-flower? It's not that you can't have flowers. It's just that a flower. Why is a flower special? Because it's unexpected. Because. It just comes up and, and blooms, and, and for a moment it takes your breath away. And normal is none of those things. Normal is the expected. Normal is the routine. Normal is safe. Right. Predictable. Um, and the only reason you should have a flower on the path is because you planted it there. That's right. That's flower number 47. <laughs> So, an unexpected flower, you get one of two reactions, which is what I find fascinating. Like, oh, isn't that beautiful? Or, that shouldn't be there. Mm. Right. (laughs) Excuse me. That shouldn't be there. And and isn't that the the crux of it? Is is normalcy, or normalcy, um, normalcy is not just what you expect, but what you have intended, what you have allowed. This is what you expect of the world. Mm. It should be running in, along these lines. And there are those that place a higher value on what they expect to happen. And as opposed to what's actually happening. Very and true. we're going into the two ways of looking at things, where you're either in the moment and taking it all in, or interpreting the moment through what you expect. Mental approach. Those are the mental eyeballs on it. Mm, and, and almost only seeing what you expect to see. I mean, that's part of, of the normalcy bias, is that despite reality, you, you only see what you want to see. Or you only prep for what you want to see. Uh, I had a, a moment, I think I told this once before, but um, we're walking along a path and a, a friend of ours was with me and we came across a rose bush and the rose had opened at that point. And it was after, I think, a rain or something. So it had some beautiful raindrops on the petals. So I took my phone out, and I was going to take a picture of it. 
and she saw me doing that. She goes, oh, no, wait, 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 and proceeded to, like, take off all the dead stuff that was on there and almost, like, wanted to clean the rose off before I took a picture. <laughs> and I, went, I was like, no, no, don't do that. Wait, wait. And I focused on the rose and um, did close-up a certain certain, uh, angle of the flower that had these interesting connections with the petals and the stamen and then the drop of water. Took the picture and I showed it to her and she went, oh, I, I didn't see that. to be because her normalcy bias was that pictures had to be pristine. They had to be not, they had to be prepared. It's not just what happened. <laughs> hey, there's, there's something there of, of the idea of spontaneity versus the planned event as well. But I think I like what you started with, which is that, you know, and, and, and this kind of ties in Van Gogh, the artist sees what is there and sees the beauty in that which may not appear to anyone else as beautiful. And then the, the true artist, the great artist, can, can take what they see and express it in a medium that then others can see. Right. But the, but the art was seen... And, and internalized and then expressed. So, so the artist has a perception of reality which is, you know, beyond. It is, it is something where they're a little more deeply connected. And the normalcy bias is a paved road. There's nothing very artistic about a paved road. It's, it's functional. It, it doesn't go anywhere, or rather, you go upon it. But it, you know, it's just—it's there. It's—it's it's the road. It's very useful. It's very—you know—you can find Route 85 and connects up to Route 77, and, and off you go. And you—you you know, you can—you can make plans on a road. But you can't plan or expect that you'll suddenly see beauty. It just happens. But if you're not looking. All you see is the road. Right. And when it comes to roads especially, we have a tendency to fixate on getting from point A to point B. I've got to get there, regardless of what's happening around me. And then people get annoyed over the fact that there's been a, an accident somewhere and I'm, I'm held up. I have to get there. Right. That's all they're thinking of. Or that some idiot sitting there watching the flowers. <laughs> it reminds me of an incident that happened when um, we were young, and and Ian was in a car seat. He was a little guy, and I was trying to get um, to my parents' house, and there had been some sort of accident, so I had to go by this. Um, side road and in the city of course side road almost anything can happen um so it took a much longer time to get from where we are to where their house was Mm. and he had fallen asleep in the back which i was grateful for you know i didn't have a crying child or anything so we finally got to a point where it was like a giant post office uh no postal hub was there and one of the trucks was like stuck on the side and it was like this was the last straw after a long ride wanting just to get to the house and suddenly I hear Ian wake up and say oh how pretty like (laughs) pretty what's pretty And on the side of the road we were stopped was a long, tall wildflower that was 
wide open and it was bobbing up and down in the um, in the breeze by the window, almost like saying, hello, how are you? And I went, oh, the things I'm getting annoyed about. It was just amazing. Exactly that. Um, and, and what would Tole say? The exact same thing. Um, that the moment of now is often overlooked. And, and one of the times that you really overlook the moment of now is when you're in your normalcy bias, you know, or when you're in a mode of I've got to get there. Right. You know, the, the, the beauty of this overgrown weed <laughs> that, that the child sees. Why? Because the child opens his or her eyes and they're in the moment of now. And, and they're not thinking of the truck or, or the traffic or I have to get somewhere or this or that. They're just opening their eyes and going, pretty, let me tell mommy. Mm-hmm. And, and if you follow your own, you know, we, the, the overused phrase of the inner child, but if you follow your own moment of now, you follow your own um, ability to perceive in that moment, because it's, Hulk Tully is also right. It's overlooked intentionally almost. It's, it, you have to, with an act of will, overlook the moment of now. And if you just give yourself half a chance, the moment of now is, is there. And, and the paved road is part of the moment of now. Yeah. But so is the flower and the sky above it. And, and you know, our, our normalcy bias is really an ego bias. It's, a, as you said, a mental spin. It's what I expect to be there, what I'm allowing to be there, what I want and, and, and approve of being there, and then anything that's getting in my ego's way, you know, in, in the way of the very important things that I've got planned to do this afternoon, um, becomes, uh, you know, something I don't want and that's unplanned and needs to be expunged from my day and I need to concentrate on the things I need to get done and and all that normalcy bias is narrowing and narrowing and narrowing your focus so you don't see the moment of now anymore. You see where you want to be and where you came from and what's going on, you know, tomorrow and all that stuff. It's believing that the plan is more important than the moment. Yeah. And um, we've all sort of been trained to that because... People want results. We want this result. We want that. And we have to be efficient in our time and can't waste time. Uh, and you sit there and you go, sounds good. But when you're in it, it's really, feels like you're under tremendous tension constantly. Nothing but stress mm. when you're thinking that way. And you get, don't give yourself room to breathe. So we've been trained that way. This is the way our society is has geared people. It's uh, result-oriented. Uh, but there's a rhythm to it all. Hmm. And the most efficiency comes when the person themselves is in a relaxed state and can be creative in their thoughts to solve problems. Um, not that there are situations where you, you really have got to move fast. And there's emergencies of every kind, but that's a different situation. Emergencies are not normal. Uh, I want to jump off on that. That's very interesting. Because um, normalcy bias acts against emergencies, too. Right. You know... Uh, this classifying it as an emergency uh, will make it so. Well, yes. It's a prejudice. I don't want the emergency. 
Yes. But what I was looking at it was more along the lines of, you know, the normalcy bias, the normalcy bias, is what keeps you from acting in sometimes an, a situation where you must act. Um, the, uh, let's just take into, in case in point, you know, if, if, if something is coming, let's say a forest fire, your normalcy bias is, it'll be okay. You know, I, it should be, nothing, nothing bad ever happens to me. I didn't plan for a forest fire coming in. And, and, and you may stay um, against all normality, or, or sorry, against all re- reality with this normalcy bias in your head that somehow, if I won't allow it, or if I disagree with it, or if I think it's bad or wrong, it's not going to happen. It's the same sort of thing which allows people to um, to endure in, in, in incredibly difficult situations because you just say, well, you know, um, it'll get better. And, and it may be in some cases that's true, but there are times, as you just said, where your normalcy bias will get you injured or killed because you just can't accept, your ego can't accept that it's time to move. It's time to accept the reality that this is a situation which requires nothing normal. <laughs> and what do people do if, if you're you know, first responders, people that run towards danger rather than away from it, train for the, so that the non-normal becomes more normal for them. They, they, they say that in this situation... Um, I know what to do. And, and the normalcy bias is, in this situation, I know what to do, and I'm going to deny all other situations because I don't know what to do about them. So I'm just going to stay here because I, I feel more comfortable here. I know what to do in the normal situation. I, I wake up, I have my coffee, I, I get in, you know, I watch TV, and I don't care about the raging forest fire. That's 10 feet away from my house. Um, mm, yeah. Just uh, not believing that it could actually happen. Even just denying, um, you know, it's normalcy bias comes with a great giant river called denial. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) It does. If if you're aware of this, I believe that the the statistic was 70% of people would rather choose to believe that it'll, it'll be all right. As opposed to looking at it going, okay, what is, what is actually happening? Hmm. And especially if it's a situation completely out of any experience they've ever had. They can't believe something could be that bad. And that's part of the normalcy bias that, you know, everything that you've experienced now is what you're going to experience for the rest of your life. It's never going to get any worse. Hmm. I just remember um, after dealing with Christopher and this was after his funeral. Um, it was very difficult going through that whole pr- process and the whole procedure. I had someone come up to me and say, well, Margaret, you know, nothing worse than this will ever happen to you. You know, you've, you've hit the worst thing. I looked at her and said, who said that what I just went through isn't preparatory for something else? She looked at me and she said, I, you, can't, you can't think that way. Like, that's reality. Well, I could never have expected what happened to us with Christopher years ago before he had gotten sick that that could be an experience. And I certainly wouldn't, could not have projected the depths of the experiences that we had. But to sit back and say, oh, well, this is the worst I'll ever experience is like you're, you're, Going right back to that idea, that normalcy bias of, oh, well, okay, 
this will be just the worst thing that will ever happen to me. Uh, no, who said? And again, I will turn that around and say, well, who said the greatest thing that could possibly be will happen to me? I have to accept both ends of the spectrum because that's the other thing that people do is their normalcy bias is always, this is the worst thing is always going to happen. But if you have any awareness whatsoever, the possibility is on both ends. And that's what gets you through. It's like you don't know what's going to happen. There's so much to unpack there, but but you're incredibly right. What what we went through with Christopher and any similar experience in anyone's life, where where you you have what you consider normal, completely and utterly abrogated and you are at sea devastated you 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 don't even know how um how to take the next breath or step so there's this this normalcy bias um when you when you have it shattered by an event there's a there's a there's denial you know, there's the seven stages of whatever, grieving. Of There's acceptance somewhere down the road. And then there's a breakthrough. If, you, if, you're, if you're able to follow it, there's a breakthrough to realize that, the, and I believe I expressed it this way, you know, the, the, the first thing you say is, why me? And when you get your breakthrough, you say, why not me? In a very, um, in a very, firm tone, you look at yourself and you say to your ego, why not me? What makes it that I shouldn't be like every other being? That bad, you know, bad things do happen, not just to good people or bad people, to every people, to all of us. And and the whole idea of bad, you know, if you go further and further into this, you, bad things is is so small because the, the bad things are the things I say are bad um, and, and that's the ego that's the little eye so when the little eye has all this taken away ripped it, you suddenly this is what in great suffering exposes the ego for what it is that it is just a bias that the ego the ego's stock in trade is the normalcy and, you, and when it's ripped away from you, you have a, it's, it's, unfortunately, it's an opportunity to, to realize something profound. And it's, it's almost the, the lightning bolt of enlightenment. It's the Buddha. It's, all life is suffering sounds so negative. But it, what it's really saying is, why not me? All life is also incredible pleasure. All life is also bliss. All life is, as you just said, anything that can possibly happen, the highest of highs, the lowest of lows at any minute, life is uncertain. And the normalcy bias hates that. The ego hates the uncertain. It's afraid, desperately afraid of the uncertain. And so that's really what the normalcy bias is all about. It's the ego trying to protect itself. And when it's ripped away, you have this really amazing opportunity it's difficult to be to appreciate it in the moment because you're usually on fire <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> unfortunately yeah yeah you have to go do something and it's a constant thing but uh you know internally if you're relying on your your heart right in other words what mm. is is feeling true to your heart. And when I say true to your heart, it doesn't mean that it's always going to be happy, happy, joy, joy, mind you. What is true to your heart, your heart knows what's true. And work within that truth of what's going on around you. Um, You are capable of being able to stand on your own two feet with 
God's grace flowing through your heart. It's the only way you can stand. Otherwise, you collapse hmm. to this, this heap or you burn up in just a pile of ashes on the floor. If, if you've identified yourself with your ego, the ego is extremely weak. Once the normalcy bias is taken away, the ego collapses. Once the normalcy bias is taken away, which is the field in which the ego operates, it tells you what's within that, the boundaries of that field and what's outside the boundaries of that field. So once that, that is taken away, all the boundaries are taken away, the ego goes into shock. It's so far outside its experience that it literally just goes flatline for a period of time because it's an overwhelm. And that's when the truth of who you are actually steps in. It's like, oh, finally, this, this part of me has stopped talking. Ah. Hmm. And what stops talking is the normalcy bias or 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 something that drives the normalcy bias. Because the ego is constantly talking about what it believes is about to happen, or what it believes about the other, or what it believes about itself. I'm always right, they're always wrong. These are the good things, those are the bad things, that tomorrow's going to be this, and yesterday's going to be that, and da 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 This is our plan, I'm writing it down, this is what's going to happen. That's right, and if anyone gets in our way, we will be very, very annoyed about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I believe we've reached our midpoint. And that's a, yeah, that's a normal. That's a normal thing to do. <laughs> let's take a let's take a normal break, and we'll come back on the other side, and we'll talk a little bit more about about crazy Vincent. Dan fans, love mythology with plenty of action and humour? Destroyer's Blood is for you. The new fantasy novel by award-winning author Michael Lines is book one of the adventures of Dev Kalian, the Blood series. Follow Dev and his magic sword betrayer as they are suddenly attacked and forced to return to Olympus to fight in a war they want no part in. The world of men and gods is about to be destroyed by Zeus's ancient foe, and only Dev and Trey can stop him. The conflict never stops, and the amazing twist will have you on the edge of your seat. Act now while the ebook is on sale for only 99 cents. Destroyer's Blood is available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, Kobo, and fine e-tailers everywhere. And while you're there, get the free prequel, It's in the Blood, available for a limited time. The Fat Man Gets Out of Bed is the latest book from Michael Lines, the award-winning author of There is a Reaper. Featuring 13 original stories, this wide-ranging collection has everything. Forbidden love, gods versus demigods, weird invading aliens, sexy seductive artificial intelligence, and unusual passion between the living and the dead. All set amidst fantastic worlds of pain and loss and boundless joy. From the sublime to the macabre to the bittersweet, the fat man gets out of bed will leave you breathless with laughter, brimming with tears, trembling with suspense. Available now on Amazon.com, Google Play, iTunes, Kobo, and fine e-tailers everywhere. Moonstones and murder. Real murderers need a heart of stone. Meet Maggie and Mike Heartstone, parents of twin boys entrepreneurs, and now empty nesters. Mike is retired, not by choice, from his position as chief of police in the picturesque resort town of Hamilton, 
And now his wife Maggie and her shop, The Cozy Crystal, are their only source of income. When a mysterious killing interrupts Hamilton's famous Springfield Park rock show, the townsfolk, The Cozy Crystal, and their lives are rocked to the core. Can Mike and Maggie figure out who is behind the murderous deeds before the town comes crashing down around them? A touch of romance, a little mayhem, and a whole lot of suspense, along with plenty of comedy and thrills galore. Get your crystal magnifying glass out. It's time for some Moonstones and Murder. Available on Amazon, Apple, Kobo, and other fine e-tailers in ebook and paperback. Out soon on Audible. Get your copy today. The wait is over. First Blood, book two of the Blood series is out. Your favorite bad boy thief, Dev, is back. And the beautiful and deadly Trey is right there with him. She is sharp, sexy, and full of surprises. Their adventures continue as a new power arises to threaten the world. The heart of creation is under attack and time is definitely not on their side as they battle against their enemies, undead hordes. Can they unlock the hidden power that can defeat him or will his forces draw first blood? Get all three installments in the series. Book Zero, It's in the Blood. Book One, Destroyer's Blood and the new release, Book Two, First Blood Today. Available in ebook and paperback format on Amazon, Kobo, Apple, and most other fine e-tailers. There is a Reaper is the story of five-year-old Christopher Aaron and his life-changing struggle with leukemia. Winner of both the Indie Bragg Medallion as well as the reader's favorite silver medal for memoir, There is a Reaper has more than 100 Amazon book reviews and a five-star rating. It has been described as life-changing, spiritual, a must-read, just released on Audible and iTunes, this memoir is also available in paperback and on Amazon Kindle for only 99 cents. Get your copy of this life-changing memoir today. Hello, this is Highway 59 recording artist Randy Moore, and you are listening to the Artist First Radio Network. for joining us on the soul of the everyman on artist first radio back to your hosts michael and margaret Lund. thank you very much team and welcome to the second half of the show of the everyman uh, the soul of the everyman because um and the second half is always the better half right. wouldn't you say yes i would i would too um so tonight we're talking about um it, it normally the second half is the better half, but tonight will be different. Uh, tonight we're talking about normalcy um, and the normalcy bias. And um, I think the the key takeaway so far is that normalcy also flies in the face of something which is incredibly important, which is reality. Reality is unfortunately not normal. Reality doesn't even have a normal in the truest sense of the word. Human beings, and, and by that I mean generally our egos, crave normal. We, we, we want to know, the ego wants to know what's going to happen next. It has, as Margaret just said earlier, a plan. And, and it's constantly talking about its plan and what's going on and how it's, you know, it's good or it's bad or it's going to make us late or we're going to have to pay more money or I don't like when this happens and they only had pistachio and da 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 that just will not leave you alone. You should have been taller. You should have been shorter. If only your mother loved you. I mean, just, just constantly thinks it wants this drone and it wants everything to be within its control. Normalcy to the ego it's about control. Yeah. And if you think about it, in terms of trying to take stock of what your own normalcy bias is, 
what's your, where are the walls of your field of, of normal? So is the response uh, to something, certain, a certain word, and suddenly it's a trigger, you realize that that was a wall emotionally for whatever, whatever it may be, whether it was childhood or, or work or relationships. It's really interesting when you begin to look at it in terms of what is my normal? What way, where, what is it that I do that pretty much keeps me within this, this box that was created uh, by my ego for what is considered normal? This is my normal box. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I love that. And, and I think that, that the normal box is, is both created by the ego and handed to you as well. Uh, your culture hands you a normal box that you're supposed to fit into. Here, here's the normal box. Now, don't kind of, you know, you get yourself in there and don't, don't stick out. Because what do we do? We, 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 we ostracize those who stick out. We mock those who stick out. We, we make them feel as though there's something wrong with you, something terribly, terribly wrong with you, because you're not normal. And, and you know, Van Gogh um, didn't fit in the normal box. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think any good artists do. Mm. Artists are see things very differently, and they have to live their way, uh, and occasionally make contact with the outside world. <laughs> yeah, occasionally, and and not and when they do make contact with the outside world, it's 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 only to be in the briefest of, of ways in contact with it. Okay. Yeah. And when things happen in terms of um, how to say this, kind of interesting because when you think of it, you're born into this world, and you can't figure out what's going on. But you're really not too concerned about it. You're like looking around, going, "Okay." Oh, uh, my eyes are awake. Our eyes are open. I'm, I'm, I'm looking around. And as you interact with your family, they teach you the family bias. Mm. This is how you function. It's not even the human bias, like, like in terms of this is how you eat, and this is how you sleep, and this is how you speak. It, it um, expands into well, this is how you behave. Mm. And there is an expected behavior, and if you showing tendencies outside the expected behavior, they shut you down quick. So then that expands because that's your family circle, and then you have to interact with, say, you're, you're going to school now. And suddenly, this is a wider world, and people are doing things um, that you don't understand. And the school itself has a set of rules that you must function within. And then that expands and expands to high school, college, work, mm. work environments. And you're interacting with people, all kinds of people. <laughs> and, and, you know, when people come to a certain point in their lives and they have this kind of midlife crisis, oftentimes they say, you know, my whole life I've been told what to do. Uh, remember the wonderful movie, uh, Robin Williams, it was called The Dead Poets Society. And, you know, I won't go into deeply into it, but part of what um, the main character was trying to teach was that normalcy was a dead end. Um, norm, normal, the normalcy bias grinds the spice and the taste and the feel out of life. And he um, particularly um, 
used a lot of Whitman because Uncle Uncle Walty was not normal. <laughs> he was way the f out there, but he found some profound truth. So, you know, um, in 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 throughout history, we have allowed culture has, cultures have allowed given space for that which is not normal. Oftentimes, it's the hermit or the crow or the the shaman or the wise woman or or the artist because even very rigid structured societies realize that there's something of great value in in coloring outside the lines you know um you don't innovate and you don't um develop as a society or a culture if you make everything into the rigidity of the ant hill that that every you know the 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 lockstep everyone knows what they do on every given day every given second of every different day is is regimented but it's an anthill you know it you have you have a society which is on autopilot and if anything upsets the anthill the ants run in all directions and the society is chaos and it's teetering on the edge of chaos because rigidity is also fragility right Right. You you can't think outside the box and what is there left for the one because that kind of, especially in ant society, they're a unit. They all have to function as a unit. They do, they're not individuals. No. The only individual that really matters is the queen. Right. And even she really is. But I mean, the, the normalcy bias is, is, is incredibly, like we were just saying uh, a few minutes ago, the ego pretends it's incredibly strong but it's incredibly fragile and weak and the tiniest little thing um you know getting cut off in traffic or being late for an appointment sends the ego into a flying tizzy Mm -hmm. because because the normalcy bias is trying to balance on the on the razor's edge of an invisible knife and on either side is chaos which you don't know how to deal with it is it it is incredibly refreshing and strengthening to accept reality as it is. That's what Tolle says. Accept the present moment as though you had planned it and and set it into motion and were responsible for it. And you will be not only happier but strengthened by that present moment. You won't be in the ego spin. But I looking at that What happens when you are so concerned about um, getting from point A to point B is that your focus has narrowed down to the single thing. You've forgotten who you are in that moment. The only thing that matters is I got to get there. And your humanity is lost in that moment. Yeah. The idea being human is to understand that you weren't meant to be this single point thing. It's like with the ants, they're given a task, they have to bring the food back to the to the ant hill. And that's what they do. They they try or they die trying. Um but that's not what a human is. No. And to understand that, that kind of narrow viewpoint with your soul. Soul is the one that interacts with the outside world and shows you many things, whether it's beauty, whether it's ugliness, what what is unfolding around you. And your reaction is got to be more than, well, I got to get there. <laughs> You've lost a big aspect of who you actually are and is that what you want because we've been trained to, to always be result oriented I've got to get there I've got to do this I've got to get this task done why because you're checking the box off what you really want to be 
few will argue, oh, well, I've considered it all, and this is the best uh, line of action that needs to be done. You sit there and you go, but circumstances change. And you reconsidering it three times with the exact same fa- same facts that you had before is useless, inefficient even. <laughs> that's that's the word the ego hates, the inefficient word. But I, I, I want to go back because what you said reminded me so viscerally of the Tower of Babel, right? Because um, turning human beings into bricks it means making them interchangeable, making them less than human, mm-hmm. making them normal, you know? Well, see, let's go back a little bit. The the in In the Bible... Human beings are likened to living stone, mm-hmm. and stone. You, they were supposed to build. Whenever they're building anything, it's from rough stone. Um, bricks were a um, way of making humans handleable. You put a handle on a human, you make them a brick. Right. A brick, uh, you know, to to um, build with bricks was to build with that which was interchangeable, which was uniform. But the the analogy was that the that um, as you said, people, a living stone, individuals, beings, um, are are completely not interchangeable they are they are of the world yet not in the world they are also sorry they're in the world not of the world and and they uh, are also um you know the reality of the stone has a presence it has a life to it a, a brick it technically has a presence but it but it it is very difficult to tell one brick from another with may, perhaps very close examination one might but one gets to the point where um human beings are are injured are are damaged and diminished by by being made into bricks and norm, the normal c bias is the ego's way of chipping the edges off of you and making you into a brick, or making your existence into something which, I think you said it earlier, it fits into the normal box, okay? Mm-hmm. You're, you're, we're all normal. Don't get outside the normal box, or you're going to be abnormal. You know, the, the normal box is, you know, it's fine, but if you, if you really try to fit everything in your life in the normal box, you're going to be cutting a lot of life off a lot of you off, a lot of everyone else around you to get in the box. Well, you have to see that. Mm. And this is what I mean by perspective or sight. Mm. When the only thing you're concerned about is the result, getting from point A to point B, then it doesn't matter if suddenly you're basically cutting off parts of yourself to fit into the norm. Mm. Which is, I mean, people do that. They want to fit in. So they'll deny um, certain aspects of themselves. Well, I, I want to be with this group of brick. <laughs> and, and they always, you always feel injured by that. And it always comes back later as a trauma or as a, as a neurosis. You know, I denied who I was to fit in. Right, that's a constant litany, uh, you know, and 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 you see it throughout artistry, where artists are persecuted, uh, some you know um, shunned, some burned at the stake, some um, the whole society cult, you know comes on them and 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 puts them in like Galileo, you know the the yeah, those who yeah. right those who 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 go outside the norms uh, get crush sometimes you know get get um you know there's there's a great rising up of the um of the body politic that loves the nor- that has the normalcy bias the normalcy bias and and wants to reject those things you know 
uh, those ideas or concepts or artistry that that doesn't fit in make why it makes it uncomfortable it it means that, that the normal box isn't fitting and someone's making it apparent that the normal box is is a limit and it's a hedge and it's a blinder uh and and when somebody p- pipes the light in there's a uh, a reaction usually a violent one against it you know against this new concept or against these uh, new things there's you know re- when people rebel against the machine you know like pink floyd you know a, another brick in the wall there's there's um there's a certain sense of um uh, of 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 bias the normalcy bias against those people they're you know they're they're trying to wreck everything they're trying to um they they're doing things which are unnatural un un you know, they, they they should be jailed. They should be this. They should. These people are are made into pariah, and that's part of the normalcy bias too. It it defends itself. You know, it 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 lashes out against anything which kind of contradicts. You know, what what did Tolle say? If you if you get angry, if your if your if your pain body or your anger comes up when somebody contradicts you. You know, stop for a minute, because that's exposing your own normalcy bias. Your own internal ego is being wounded by this by someone telling you, you know, you're wrong. What do you mean I'm wrong? Oh, that's you know, even the most great spiritual teachers, you contradict them, they get all bent out of shape. You know that they're not quite there yet. <laughs> yes, the normalcy is normal for whom? Is my question. Mm. You know, someone has come up with a normal, but it's, if you think of it in terms of yourself, you actually set up what's normal for you, whether you believe it or not. You adapt according to what you've been shown or taught or what's been required of you, but you can actually choose your own norm. But I think that's healthier, frankly. Well, this is what I mean. It's not a default position. You have to be conscious of what it is that you're choosing, not just, well, we always did it this way, or this you know, group of people, I, we've always been with them, so this is the way they said it always had to be. And to be able to take stock of that and say, wait a minute, normal for whom? And that's when you begin to realize that groups that have always done things a certain way Um, there is so much room for abuse by those that are in charge Um, yeah I can I can say that um, just for the Asian culture you know there is a very strong um, norm of you respect your elders, you never talk back, you don't um, you you basically listen to everything they say and whatever rules they set down because this is what we've done for the longest time and this is what's worked for us, you know, and it's generational work. That's worked for us all this time. And what I found fascinating was a lot of that is imposed without taking into account the fact that you are in a different environment now. Not to say that you begin to disrespect your parents. But you see that there is more than what has been set up for you in a society that was agrarian, let's say, and suddenly you're in the modern, quote-unquote, modern world where things are a lot easier. Um, So it makes for a caste system. Hmm. Well, I mean, all those things are normalcy bias in cultures. (coughs) Excuse me. Normalcy bias in cultures. Uh, has been the, the source of great distress over many, many generations. But I, I like what you just said. The the whole idea of normal for me 
<coughs> excuse me, is a very courageous thing. But one thing we have to say is normal for this show is we're going to have to come to an end right now. So oh. mm-hmm. it's the normal time to end, and I'm Michael Lyons in the non-normal way. Margaret, and thank you for listening. <laughs>